The focus on today is going to be code, build, and monitor. I like to think of that as the code time. Think of that as a point of entry where a real vulnerability might actually enter your code base and enter your world. Or maybe the build time where we're looking at the pipeline and all the automation around it. Or monitor or runtime. So code time, build time, runtime. Let's actually talk about all three of those things. But more importantly, let's demonstrate them to you. So from a developer perspective, they're going to live within their IDE, their integrated development environment. They're going to be in there coding and adding different dependencies, sometimes things they find on the public internet. And in this case, you can see I have a Palm XML here, which is the artifact that you would use in a Maven-based build for a Java-based application. I know XML seems a little bit old school, but you can kind of see right there, I have my angle brackets and I have this thing called struts. And that's actually the struts that was very problematic not too many years ago. But I might also have like the log4j, which was very notable in December of 2021, but we've seen what these uh, these different dependencies can bring with them because we might have actually included it from a transitive dependency standpoint. In other words, the tree of dependencies could go on and on and on, and it's easy for a Java-based application to have 100 to 100 plus uh, you know different dependencies. And if you're a Node or Python shop, you could easily have a thousand plus dependencies that are pulled in based on the developer simply identifying those artifacts and pulling them into their build process through their requirements.txt in the case of Python or package JSON on in the case of Node.js. We have an IDE plugin here that helps you identify those critical vulnerabilities. You can see it actually flagging them in the case of my Palm XML. This is based on Visual Studio Code, but we're also, uh, we also have one for IntelliJ. And right now I'm showing you Palm XML, but we're working towards having package JSON requirements.txt and also working within the Go ecosystem. You can see here too that it's not just CVE flagging, but we might also have a recommendation for you. So we will produce the SBOM, right, Software Build Materials, and we'll also have what's known as a VEX file, Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange, that helps you identify is it exploitable and is there a better recommendation and can Red Hat provide you an an element that basically says uh, this problem has been solved, right? So the user, the developer in this case, can take the action to solve it for themselves and self-serve. And this is known as Red Hat Trusted Content. And the goal here is to shift all the way left and actually de deal with the point of the vulnerability at the point of entry. Now I want to switch gears all the way to the build pipeline. So we've seen code now, the code time side of it. Now let's talk about the pipeline side of it, all the automation necessary to validate that the developer has done all the right kinds of things. Let's say they've actually cleaned up their code base and put it all in a Git repository. It's pretty common for people to do a Git commit, Git push. Now it's out there. So let's try to onboard it now into our CI CD process and put it into a Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to hit create application. I'm going to paste in the URL for my Git repository. You can see it right there. And I'm going to hit import code. So with just a few simple clicks, we're going to identify what that application looks like. You can see here, we see that it's a Spring Boot application, but it could also have been Quarkus, it could have been Node, it could have been Python, Go, or even anything with a Docker file. And we have lots of appropriate defaults, including a default Docker file, uh, as well as you know things like ports, CPU, memory. I'm going to just leave all those defaults in place and hit create application. So in just a few clicks, I have now onboarded that application from the Git repository that had no Docker file inside it, no YAMLs inside it, and I have onboarded it to a full software supply chain focused CICD process that includes a nice build, and we can go look at the pipeline execution here, and we can go see that it's running through this series of steps, and it has this out-of-the-box pre-opinionated uh, pipeline that is actually part of the Red Hat productization system. So we actually had to rebuild our internal container engine, container image productization engine, and we have done so now, and we're working on gaining our internal customers, but we want to make this visible to our external customers as of today. So now you can kind of see that we have uh, this pipeline running. It's going to do a uh, clone repository. Prefetch dependencies allows you to do a network isolated build or what's known as a hermetic build. It's going to build the container, produce an SBOM. As a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and fast forward at this point to show you what it looks like when it's finished. So I'm going to jump all the way over here to where I can upgrade that pipeline now. So it, you can see that this one's finished. It did the build container and produce the software bill of materials, and it also has a show summary, but it skipped these steps in the middle. And I'm showing this on purpose because we have a fast onboarding process. We want to make it super uh, point and click and super painless, but you can then upgrade that experience to the more software supply chain oriented pipeline with a few simple clicks. So let's go in there now and say, I want to go to my partner catalog, and I go to components, and I want to say, manage the build pipeline, 
and it's going to say, okay, now this is going to practice pipelines as code. I'm going to say send pull request. It's going to go out there to my GitHub repository. And you can see it failed in this case because I did not yet install the GitHub application. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say install the GitHub application. And yep, let's just say install here. I do need to log in and we'll go ahead and log in. And there it is. If we go back over here now, we should be able to send that pull request with success. So it's going to attempt to send it one more time and see that it lands out there. And it did. Now it says, would you like to merge it? I'm going to click over there and say, yes, let's merge it and confirm that merger. And at this point, our pipeline should be kicked off. It should be noted that there is now a Tekton folder out here that represents the YAML files for that software supply chain focused uh, Tekton chains based pipeline that we mentioned earlier. So let's actually go check it out. Let's go see if it's running and we'll go to activity and there it is. It's kicked off now. So it's going to go through that process. Let's fast forward one more time to show you what this looks like when it's completed. Also, I want to show you what it looks like if a user has customized it slightly. In this case here, you can kind of see it's gone through the build container, produced that SBOM, as I mentioned, the software build materials, but also has done some label checking, inspection of the image, Claire scan. This is Rock CTL, which we'll talk more about in a second, but this not only looks for CVEs, but also looks for policy enforcement points. Like, do you have YAML files in that, uh, in that Git repo that's coming in? And do those um, uh, YAML files have all the appropriate settings in them? For instance, do you have a uh, deployment YAML with secrets that are exposed as environment variables, and that's a policy violation. You also have the trusted content. You saw that earlier with the recommendations uh, that we had earlier. But if I look at this require, uh, Rock CTL one, you can see it found a bunch of vulnerabilities. I purposely loaded in a ton of uh, ugly ones in this case, but to show you that it will find them and flag them. And of course, this build pipeline, as I mentioned, is part of the Red Hat Next Generation productization engine, and you can see what it's doing here. Now, I want to show you that SBOM in particular, because that's a particularly interesting aspect of this. I'm going to go over to this uh, screen, open this up, and copy this line out, and go over to my command line tool. So I could actually get the SBOM from the web user interface, but let's do it from the command line in this case. This is using the cosign tool, which is part of our popular SIG store open source project. And you can see there, I can basically say, return to me that software bill of materials. I can grep through it if I want to, like I can look for log4j. I can basically say, okay, is that the log4j that's worrisome? I can look for struts. Maybe that's the worrisome one. And the whole idea of the SBOM is much like that food product at the grocery store. You have an ingredients list on the back, and it's required to let people know what ingredients went into that uh, food item before you consume it. And let's say you might be allergic to nuts. Well, in this case, you might be allergic to struts, as an example. So I'm going to do a couple more little things here and show you something else that's interesting about what you see here with the cosine tool. I'm going to come in here and show you this, right? So in this case, that image that's coming through that pipeline I mentioned earlier has actually got a series of images being created. It's actually got the attestation layer, the signature layer, and of course the SBOM we mentioned, all in addition to the business logic application sitting on top of a UBI, Universal Base Image, and Red Enterprise Linux container image. So your application now running within the context of a Linux-based container, all but a, a bunch of points and clicks, and of course running it through that engine. Now let's show you another aspect of this that I think is super important. And that is, let's say that the user, having customized their pipeline, might have also tried to remove things like the CVE scanner as an example. Or maybe they didn't actually uh, use an appropriate base image as another example. Well, this is known as the enterprise contract. It's based on the Rigos policy language. We have 43 out-of-the-box rules. In this case, I engage 20 and the minimal collection in this case. But this helps us actually determine if the attestations and the salsa level provenance placed in that pipeline, placed in that container image, was adhered to or not, or did someone try to customize their way around it as an example. So this gives you another checkpoint to determine if the image should go forward from dev to stage to prod, let's say, and be promoted down through your different environments, your downstream environments. So you can see that it will look for things like all the appropriate uh, tasks have been executed. You have an appropriate base image. You don't have an excessive number of CVEs or no critical uh, CVEs as an example. All those rules can be applied at this point to verify that the image should be 
further promoted as an example. And of course, you can deploy that image out across the Open Hybrid Cloud. In this case, we have a default out-of-the-box development environment, but you might also decide, I want to now shoot it out to Amazon, Google, or Azure, wherever in the world you want it to go. As long as you have access to it from a network perspective, this uses Argo CD and GitOps to basically push out that image to all the appropriate remote clusters. And again, it just needs a Kubernetes cluster for that. So I want to show you one more thing, and I'm going to take you over here to the monitoring environment. So we talked about code time, build time, now let's talk about the runtime. And in this case, this is known as Advanced Cluster Security for Kubernetes. Again, as of today, a cloud service that you can come try with a simple point and click, like you saw the other options earlier. Now, in this case, I can see that I have a lot of different policy violations. I have seven different clusters, uh, so seven different clusters that I've deployed around the globe, all the way from Bangalore and Tokyo, coming through Europe and with Amsterdam uh, and Frankfurt, and coming into the US with like Toronto and New York as an example. I even have one down in Cape Town, South Africa. But you can see that we have images that are at risk, that they might have a lot of vulnerabilities. I purposely loaded this thing up with lots of interesting things like struts and log for shell. But there's also some other aspects of this that are very important. So it's a great vulnerability dashboard. What vulnerabilities are in my container images sitting out there in my runtime environment? That could be very important to you. And you might want to understand specifically which of these policies is it violating, like that specific struts vulnerability it could be very important. And we have some failing deployments as an example. But also, we will look at all these things from a risk perspective. So I like the aspect of having risk as part of the calculation, because not every vulnerability is exploitable, as you might know. As a matter of fact, here's one that has an active exploit occurring. In this case, not only was there a significant issue with that image, but the pod itself has had someone go into it and run things like a package manager, wget, maybe a curl command, and use the user add command from a Linux perspective. And these are things you want to be able to watch out for because that adds additional risk. If it's being actively exploited, maybe that's something that you really want to flag and get on top of. There's also a great compliance tool that's in here. You can see here that I have CIS Docker, CIS Kubernetes, HIPAA, NIST, etc. And I can even look at this from the perspective of a specific namespace. And I can actually look at this namespace and I can contact the Frankfurt folks, right? Basically, this is my Frankfurt cluster. And I can say, hey, you have a 49% compliance in this namespace. Let's work together to basically bring you up to a greater compliance level and help them understand what policies we're enforcing. So this tool not only helps you understand those CVEs, but also is your cluster, your Kubernetes cluster, properly configured in a secure and safe way. So your overall security posture is better informed by things like compliance and policy, making sure you don't have service accounts that are too wide, uh, too wide open, making sure you don't have a network topology that's too permissive, as an example, both egress and ingress, but also the fact that within Kubernetes, you can have the, a flat network where every service sees every service across every namespace, and that might be something you don't want. And we can also simulate those network policies to actually give you that YAML file to basically help you lock those uh, networks down a little bit more. So if you think of uh, ACS here, Advanced Cluster Security, as your Kubernetes native security solution, it is applying rules and policies and governance and capability across the entire fleet, across uh, across your entire cluster. And in this case, my clusters include EKS, AKS, GKE, and uh, multiple Kubernetes types, as well as OpenShift, that can, and it can work off from that perspective. Again, now available as a cloud service, you can just simply come in and point and click. And, that, and the last little bit I'll mention, just because I have it at this point in time, is all those images that we talked about are sitting at rest at Quay in this case. And you can see here that I actually have also, uh, we can also do the CVE scanning at rest. So sometimes CVEs just show up kind of randomly and the image has not been built, has not been coded against in quite a while, but we want to know that maybe that thing is collecting CVEs as it sits there. And all of that is part of the code, build, and monitor, and the overall story of the Red Hat Trusted Software Supply Chain.